If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, people who had weird things happen in supernatural and paranormal woods and forests. Tell us your story that made you not want to go back into the woods ever. Okay, so this past year I was out hiking while my family was at a family reunion somewhere around York, Pennsylvania. I was on the side of a mountain, I guess, and there was a forest there. So I'm hiking down the slope, and I get this feeling. It's one I'll never forget. I got this feeling like I was being watched, and whatever was watching me did not want me there. I brushed it off and kept going. I regretted that. The feeling kept getting stronger. I eventually came to a white building and said to myself, nope, not having any more of that. And I bolted back up the slope. It's October 30th, which instantly leads me to believe it was a spiritual experience. I'm in Illinois, by the way. I go for walks a lot through my local forest preserve. There's a specific tree on my walk that I like to stop and talk to. Today I got to the forest preserve around 5.30 or 40 p.m., and it was cold and drizzling outside. There was an overcast too, so it wasn't very bright but also wasn't dark. For the first time ever, there wasn't anyone else in the parking lot, which I loved because I didn't have to awkwardly pass people. So I get out of the car and start walking down the path, totally vibing with nature. I get about three quarters of the way to my tree and suddenly start to feel uneasy, like I'm being watched. Since I know there's no one else on the trail and it's getting darker, this scared me, and I decided to turn around. As I made this decision, I noticed something white floating in the distance behind a tree. It was bobbing as if trying to hide from me but also watching me. Naturally, I turn around and book it back towards my car. I get about 100 feet from the end of the trail and start to walk again because I didn't see anything following me. Suddenly, the same white thing bobs in front of me about 10 feet away around a bend and then quickly bobs back behind the bushes. The best way I can describe it is as a white towel looking thing, as if someone were holding it in one spot and bobbing it up and down. It was floating about 5 to 6 feet in the air, and I want to describe it as shy. When I realized it wasn't a person, I went to look for it, but it was nowhere to be found. I'm very curious as to what or who that was. I'm not expecting anyone to believe me, but I wanted some answers or theories on what I saw. So a few weeks ago, I was cruising down some back roads with a friend when we decided to take a small road off the main one. It was one lane and covered by trees, and about halfway down the road, we started getting cold chills and feeling uneasy. We got to the end, which was a bridge to a driveway barely wide enough for my jeep, and it looked like it was about to fall into the creek. We decided to back up into a turnaround spot to get out of there when I got the feeling to turn around and look back again. There, about 20 feet away, was a seven-footish skinny figure that looked like someone threw a dark black blanket over themselves, moving slowly and smoothly towards my friend's side of the jeep. Whatever it was got pelted with gravel, and we almost crashed a few times while I was going 85 down the road. Once we got back on the main road, my friend realized we were crossing the bridge, on the main road, where someone off their head a few years ago. What really messes me up is that he didn't see it, and it was going towards him. Anyway, if anyone could tell me what they think it is, it would be appreciated. I am from Eastern Europe. I will tell you a story that my grandparents and mother used to talk about. My great-grandfather went to the forest to pick up some wood. He went there during the night since it was illegal to take wood from the forest. By chance, he met another man from the village who was doing the same thing. They agreed to stick together. A little time passed when they saw a small billy goat. Its fur was black. My great-grandfather assumed that someone had lost it. They decided to take the billy goat with them in order to share its meat later. They put the billy goat in a sack, and then weird stuff started to happen. The sack became heavier and heavier, and they exchanged it often between them. At some point, the billy goat was so agitated that my great-grandfather said, Take it easy, billy goat. The paranormal thing is that the goat repeated the same exact words in a weird voice. My great-grandfather had a gun and shot the sack twice. There was nothing but thin air. They were convinced it was the devil since they had in mind to steal wood. In January of 2020, my brother, fiancé, kid, and I decided to go backpacking in southern Indiana. We stayed at a shelter that is close to the Ohio River. At about 1 p.m. my brother and my kid were asleep, and my fiancé and I were out by the fire just talking. My fiancé got scared and pointed to multiple lights in the woods, it looked like there were 5 to 10 people out there with flashlights coming towards us. I was going up to my brother so he could see and get his gun if need be, but before I could get him up, one by one, the lights started to disappear. We spoke with him about it the next morning, and he said it was probably lights from the boats that passed by the river. The next night, we waited for the boats to pass by again, 
and none of them made the same lights as the night before. Because of where we saw the lights, it seemed that it was too far away from the river to reflect that far into the woods. Then, around 5 to 530 a.m. the morning of the third day, while I was laying in the shelter and everyone else was asleep, I was woken up by what sounded like people whispering, and then I saw a shadow or something through the cracks of the shelter. When I poked my head out the door, nothing was there. We have been back to that exact spot multiple times and haven't experienced anything like it since. Norway. A couple of years ago, when I was roughly 14, there was this trail between my neighborhood and the school I used to go to. It took about 10 minutes to get across it. Covered full of tree branches and a deep valley, you need to climb with a little creek running through it. This is one particular autumn day. The leaves were falling off the trees, and the temperature was getting a little lower, 8 degrees Celsius, roughly. This was the one time I experienced this hyper uncomfortably uncomfortable feeling that I was being watched by something. You don't know how that feeling feels unless you have either been hunted or looked at with strong feelings. I had the feeling that I was being watched, and me being the paranoid and curious kid I still am, I took a glance back to where I came from. I saw nothing, so I kept walking. I hear someone say my name, and I look back, expecting one of the kids from my neighborhood to want to walk with me back home. No. I saw nothing. There was nothing behind me. I even stood there for what felt like a solid minute but was probably more like 5 to 7 seconds before I bolted it. The problem was. Someone could have been yelling my name as a state due to the valley being there, but at the same time, the yelling came from this rock a little bit to the right. Whatever was calling my name was behind the big rock. I believe there was a reason our ancestors were weary of the woods. I have heard of skinwalkers, wendigos, or flesh gates. But the problem is that I live in Norway. How could this be? Telemark County, to be specific. Anyone else with this experience? I am in Moorhead, Kentucky, and have been experiencing unexplainable things while I've been hiking around Eagle Lake or near Cave Run. I'm not a superstitious person, and I am very rational when it comes to the animals in our region. It will sound as if something is approaching, coming much closer than any animal should, and when noticed, I react, stomp my feet, etc., it stops. An unrelenting dread and overwhelming anxiety fall over me, I cannot shake it, and I know I have to leave at that point. Each time, as I've started to leave, whatever it is has charged quickly, coming much closer and essentially chasing me from where I've been. I refused to return to Eagle Lake after experiencing it for the first time and chose to go to a pretty popular area near Cave Run. The same exact thing has happened more than once. I have not been able to shake the feeling. I have definitely been the only one in the area on both occasions, and there have been no animals near definitely not ones large enough to make the sounds I've heard. My girlfriend has been with me on each occasion and has heard and felt the same as me. If anyone has seen, felt, or heard anything, please let me know. So yesterday, I was walking my dog. It's late, it's foggy. We are walking on the trail, and then my pup sees something. I see it too, it looks like a ribbon fluttering and moving deeper off trail, about 12 feet in the air. I chased the dog and got her back, no problem but it seemed like I watched this thing try and lure my dog. It was like a handkerchief dropping up and down and moving further into the woods. My first reaction was that it's an injured bird from hunting, but I don't know, man. I mean, I get it. I thought it was an injured bird or a nighthawk, but then I got the chills. The weird thing is that my dog always barks at SHT because she's a pup. But this time, she didn't. Anyone else have a similar experience? I grew up in the woods. Hunted fished, camped, explored. I played war when I was a child. I never had any fear. I love the woods. I will say, not much of a hiker. But I've been hiking quite a few times. I would rather be fishing, camping, or just ducking off in the woods. Climbing trees. Building tree forts. Mountain biking, parking, and walking half a mile into the trees to a stream I know exists just for a few drinks of fresh water. The point is, I've spent a lot of time in the woods, and I enjoy it. I'm comfortable. This only happened once. I've charged through trails in pitch black without a flashlight, just knowing the trail, nights I snuck out to parties from my uncle's home with my cousin. I never once felt fear. Maybe fear that my uncle might be up, ready to tear into us when we got home, but never fear of anything in the woods. One night, in high school, me and some pals were deep in the woods, and this ducking howl, I don't live in wolf country, and this was no human, clawed into the night air and really scared a lot of people but didn't bother me. At. All. The one time I was scared and the woods happened in daylight. At the time, my commute to work was about 30 minutes. 
a little long, but not bad. Every time I drive to work, I drive along a small river. The river was backed by thick woods. At one point, the trees opened up to a brief clearing where there was this old barn house. Or, stables for horses? I don't know these things. I'm not a farmer. But the structure was old and impressive, and I wanted to photograph it. Every time I passed this structure sitting in the clearing on the other side of the river, I felt like I just needed to bring my DSLR and go shoot the damn thing. About half a mile past the structure on the road I was on was a pull-off where there was a footbridge to cross the river onto the heavily wooded other side. One day, I brought my camera. I was dressed for work. Nice pants. Dress shirt. Tie. Typical shit. I was only about 25 years old. I had no fear. At all. I pulled into the pull-off, got out, and crossed the bridge. It was summer. It was hot. But nice. I made my way into the woods, down to the structure. The river was loud, so there weren't your typical forest noises. I just heard the river. The structure wasn't as impressive as I'd originally thought. Neither were my photo skills. I didn't have a wide-angle lens, so I really had to be creative to get what I wanted. Either way, I didn't really kill it. I wasn't happy about the situation, but it was a nice day, and I was just happy to be out in the woods. As an adult, I don't get out in the forest nearly as much. Then something just happened. Off. Ducking. Fear and panic. Suddenly grabbed my soul and screamed, run, that's what I did. I ran. I didn't hesitate. I didn't try to calm myself down. I didn't look behind me, to my left, or to my right. I ran. I mean, I ducking ran all the way to my car. About half a mile was pure sprinting, and my adrenaline kept me going. I got in my car, and I drove to work. I honestly never thought much about it because nothing really happened except me getting spooked. While I never thought much of it, whenever I pass that point, since the structure has been ripped down and a paved bike path goes through it, I think about it. My friend and I decided to go camping in a remote place. We began the walk to the remote location, which was a small stream in a valley surrounded by hills and mountains. And after setting up and eating, we were ready for bed. After a while of not being able to sleep, I decided I needed to go out for a piss. I unzipped the tent, this would have been around midnight, and went outside to relieve myself. While pissing, I was looking into the pitch black, and suddenly the entire riverbed and hill over 600 meters tall were completely illuminated. The shading of the light was odd, however, usually things that are closer to a light source are much brighter than something that is far away, but with this everything, even the objects that seemed closer to the location of the source were the same brightness as the summit of a 600 meter hill. About 1.5 to 2.5 seconds after it began, it turned off, everything reverted to complete darkness, and my ears were my only useful sense. I could only hear complete silence. After standing there stunned for about 10 seconds, another section of bush and completely different peaks about 500 to 700 meters upstream were illuminated. Again, the area of illumination was immense, and everything was the same shade of brightness and completely still. After about 3 to 4 seconds, it shuts off again. I stood there in hopes that if it turned on a second time, I would see it again. Thinking it was just a hunter or some person with an inhumanly powerful flashlight, I woke my buddy up and explained what I saw, and he started looking too. The light turned on again, and to my horror, it had moved inhumanly fast up the river bed. I'm talking about 1.5 to 2 kilometers, probably more, upstream through bends and through native forest, we live in New Zealand. The light was shining past its point of origin another kilometer or two and was illuminating an entire mountainside, with scree, cliff, and foliage fully visible. This completely destroyed my idea of this being some hunter or someone with a spotlight in the valley. This wasn't some helicopter with a light either, as it was densely overcast and misty. And there wasn't a sound of anything anywhere. It wasn't the moon either, it was far too bright, and its point of origin was clearly the riverbed. This genuinely has no viable explanation I can think of, and I've thought of everything. My husband and I recently bought and moved into a new home. When we moved in, we were shocked at how great the new house felt. It's bright and light, not just with windows and sunlight, but in the way it feels. Like positive energy. I can't explain it well, but we feel happy and comfortable in this house like we haven't since before we moved into our last home. I don't think either of us realized how dark and negative that house felt, because as soon as we moved in, we had several traumatic experiences unrelated to the house, so our dark moods and negativity were always contributing to that. I did have some thoughts that there was dark energy or something demonic in or around that house, but I'm also paranoid and terrified of the paranormal, so I never gave it too much credence that it wasn't just in my head. Until last night. Last night, we had friends visiting from LA. 
we were discussing the new house versus the old house, and I described to our friends what I wrote above and gave them this example. If I was ever outside after dark, coming home from a night out or from working late, there was always one spot on the edge of our property right in the tree line where the woods began that would give me a terrified and panicky feeling. Like something evil was watching and might bolt out and chase me at any moment. I used to sprint up our stairs, burst into the house, and only feel safe once inside. I would dread coming home after dark because of this feeling. I never told my husband about this before last night. But very calmly, like he's playing it cool, he asks me where that spot was that I felt it. I described it, and he says, holy shit I felt the same way about that exact spot too. I freaked out. What are the chances that two people, who couldn't be more different with beliefs in the paranormal, have the same specific reaction to a specific spot like that? Although he attributes the feeling to deer living in the woods right there and watching, he's not one to make things up for a reaction or to freak someone out, so that was all the confirmation I needed that it wasn't just paranoia or in my head, it's not deer living in the woods, but something in and or near that house was evil and dark. Back when I was 19, I had just made the decision to join the military, so I was still living with my parents until I shipped to basic training. My family itself is a military one, so we moved around a lot, this being one of the last places we moved to before my dad finally retired. It was a small city in South Carolina, and the house itself was relatively young and located in the middle of a forest at the bottom of a hill. We could still see our neighbors, barely through the trees. Right off the bat, I knew there was something off about that place. Looking at pictures of it before we moved, a voice in my head was practically screaming, it's in the woods. It's in the woods. Over and over. But only when I saw the outside of the house, not the interior, once we got there, my mother had an odd experience when a police officer pulled up and said he was just checking things out. We never saw him again. I didn't spend much time outside, but when I did, I would sometimes get a sense of something mischievous hiding in the trees, beckoning me to come with it. It was almost like it wanted me to play with it. Had I been younger and didn't know the things I knew about the paranormal, I might have gone with that feeling. One night, I was woken up by scratching and rustling outside my window. For reference, this was a single-story house, so I got up, hoping I could catch a glimpse of some wildlife, like a raccoon. I tiptoed to the guest room and peeked out the window, only to back away less than a second after I pulled up the blind. But that was enough to sear the image in my memory. It was crouching down, I know this because I could make out the outline of its knees and shoulders, but standing, it would have been tall. I want to say it was covered in fur or hair, but it was too dark to see. The only thought going through my head was it saw me. I quickly went back to bed and somehow got back to sleep. I didn't say anything for a while until my mom started saying she was experiencing things. Not as numerous as me, but we began swapping stories. One morning, close to my departure, I was home and doing laundry. The light in my room hadn't worked since we moved in, so I used a bedside lamp. The view from the laundry room was such that I could see down the hall but not into the rooms. I saw more light than usual coming through my room, so I thought I had left my bedside lamp on. Walking into my doorway, I looked at the lamp, and it was off, but the light was still in my room. I looked up, and the light that hadn't worked for months was blazing bright. I turned the switch off and texted my mom, asking if she or dad had fixed the light in my room. They didn't, when I finally left that house, things switched for me to my mom. She would write me letters telling me about what was going on. One night, she and my dad were talking by the front door when they heard someone run up on the porch and begin rattling the doorknob. My dad quickly threw the door open, but there was no one there. My parents moved from that house soon after. I don't know what was around that house. It wasn't human by a long shot, but I hesitate to say it was demonic in nature. It was something of the land. Three of my friends and I went out into this Adirondack shelter that we called the Addy, which was maybe 500 feet into the woodlot at the edge of our dorm parking lot. It's basically a small lean-to shelter built out of logs with a metal roof and an open front. It's a spot we've been going out to almost every night for several years to smoke weed before bed and sometimes during the daytime. Occasionally, we'd see some strange things that we couldn't explain, like random lights off in the distance of varying colors disappearing and reappearing in no particular pattern. The woods were several acres deep in that direction, and it was a rural area with family-owned agricultural fields at some point past the forest, but too far off that you'd never see any farm lights from where we were. You could walk 30 minutes in that direction and still not be out of the woods. This night we saw the same lights, and they are often accompanied by an uneasy feeling. Granted, I know every time we saw these, we were smoking weed and maybe getting a bit paranoid, but it was a trend, and I wasn't the only one noticing them. Anyway, this one particular night, all of us were feeling uneasy and hyper-aware of our surroundings, 
trying to finish up our bowl and go back to the dorm. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, there was a huge crash on top of the metal roof of the apartment. All four of us happened to be sitting in a small circle in the inside corner of the shelter on the floor. We were all terrified and grabbed each other, ducking as close to the floor as possible, expecting the shelter's roof to collapse in on us. It sounded like a huge tree fell on top of the shelter. A moment later, when the shelter held strong, we all shakily looked around. We all quickly decided to get up and go back to the dorms. It was night, so we couldn't see anything obvious as we were leaving, but all our hearts were racing, and we were too shook up to stay and investigate. The next day, we went out there during daylight to see how big the tree was that fell, and there were no down trees around the attic and no fallen branches large enough to make that loud of a sound anywhere in sight. That was terrifying to discover. I tried doing some research to see if anything weird happened out in those woods or in the area previously, as I've had several unexplainable experiences there throughout the years. I found that there is an old fort about 15 to 20 miles away from where our college is, and there was a big ambush involving Native Americans way back during the French and Indian War, where many Native Americans and French died. I always wondered if any of the paranormal experiences in those woods were related to the Native American spirits that had previously called those woods their home. I'll never know for sure, but it's interesting to think about. So I went out a very early morning around 5 a.m. to take photos in the forest since I have always liked the vibe of the forest, especially during the morning since it has a kind of calmness to it. I live in central Sweden, where we have many deep forests everywhere, much of which is untouched. Think of plenty of moss and old trees. This particular forest I went to was quite near my home, however, since I lived in the countryside, I was very alone with no other soul around. During this morning, there was also fog lingering on the treetops from the surrounding rivers, which looked really cool, to be honest, so I was so ready to take some cool photos. I went into the forest after parking my car along the road that went beside it and started walking straight in. After maybe 100 meters, I stopped to take some photos, mostly of dead trees, mushrooms, and things like that, I was 20 and felt very artsy. After a few minutes, I started hearing knocks on trees. Probably a bird, I thought, since we have woodpeckers around here, so hearing that wasn't unusual. The strange thing is that I started looking for it since it came from a tree that was right beside me, but I could not find it. Unlucky, I thought. I wanted to see if I could get a nice photo, but I decided to move on. I continued walking into the forest when I noticed something. The knocking or pecking seemed to follow me as I walked. It continuously knocked on trees close to me. At this point, I didn't think too much about it, however, that would change after a while. I stopped at a spot that looked really nice to set up my camera on a tripod in an attempt to maybe snap some cool photos of the surrounding area and treetops. I sat down and continued to hear the knocking on a tree just a few meters behind me. At this point, I started to feel a little weird since I had really noticed how it seemed to follow me. A few seconds later, while changing my camera settings, I suddenly heard several very loud, clear, and heavy footsteps behind me that rapidly came closer and closer until they were right behind me. My whole body froze. I have not until this day experienced chills like that through my entire body. After what felt like several seconds, I flew up and turned to what I thought was some kind of big animal, but nothing was there. For context, beside a few trees, this area was not dense. There are just a few trees here and there, but mostly moss and grass. I picked up all my things and started walking really fast back towards my car, and that's when the knocking started again. It followed me again, and I just knew something was mocking me, so I even said out loud, yes, I am leaving. I knew that whatever it was, it did not want me there. I continued to hear the knocking until I came back to the spot where I first started hearing it, and it just stopped. I did not. I went straight back to my car and went home. Before this, I was skeptical of the paranormal, but it really changed my views. Since then, I have only had one more experience, but this is the one that really scared me. It was summer in Canada, and I, along with two of my friends, had planned to spend a few days camping. We actually found a small cabin that was available on these small cabin grounds for a cheap price. It was a large piece of forested land by a lake with a bunch of cabins scattered around, and you could rent them for however long, we booked the place at the last minute and decided to go there instead of camping. If you have ever been to northern Canada, then you know how barren the place is, with a man-made structure every couple of kilometers and forest all around us. Three hours later, when we arrived, it was maybe around 4 p.m. we met with the owner, who lived in a larger cabin nearby, and after talking and paying for our stay, we went off to our cabin. The cabin was small, with a stream leading up to a larger lake right beside the cabin. And a small fire pit out front. There was dense forest pretty much all around us, and being that far out, we had little to no service. 
we took advantage of the daylight, took out some kayaks that came with the cabin, and explored our surroundings. As it got dark, we set up a small campfire in front of the cabin in the fire pit and just talked. A massive thunderstorm snuck up on us, and it soon started to rain. Since it was raining, we didn't bother to put the fire out since it was already basically going out by itself. We went inside and got ready for bed. The beds were all in the same room, so we just talked for the most part since we couldn't fall asleep, with thunder in the distance and rain pattering on the window of the cabin. My two friends decided to go outside to have a cigarette, and since I didn't smoke, I just tagged along for fun. I was behind them, and as they opened the door, they said, hey, the fire is still lit. I thought to myself, how could it still be lit? It was raining, and the fire was basically going out by itself. I looked over their shoulders and saw the fire still burning away, as if it were just lit and was burning at full strength. Just after that, they kind of froze and whispered, what's that? Before yelling and running back into the room and slamming the front door shut. I couldn't get a visual of what they saw because I was all the way behind them, and it happened way too fast, so I assumed they were joking around, but the expression on their faces just showed pure fear, so I took it seriously, and we all went into our bedroom and locked the door behind us, they were clearly frightened and completely out of breath. I asked them what they saw, and they explained that they saw a wispy white figure that went into a pine tree, which was about 15 feet from the fire pit. The figure apparently moved very quickly and then popped its head out to the side of the tree before hiding again. They described it as almost like smoke but moving like a person being around 6 to 7 feet tall. I peeked out the window to see if it was still there, and I didn't see anything except for that fire still burning. We basically stayed up all night and never saw my friends that afraid, especially with one of them being in the military, he just held his knife next to his chest while lying in bed and staring at the ceiling, not saying a word the whole night. In the morning, we tried finding an explanation for it, but we couldn't come up with anything. We spoke to the owner about it, and he told us he would be on the lookout. I wish I could have seen it for myself, but they swear by what they saw, and it was definitely nothing they have ever seen before. We still couldn't find an explanation for what happened that night. I'm way into amateur astronomy, so on the rare chance that I get enough time off, I love to head into the wilderness to stargaze. I spend a lot of time in rural Oregon, so I'm no stranger to the wildlife, and otherwise, roaming around. I've only had two experiences that I really can't explain. At one point, a friend of mine and I were out past government camp on the southern side of Mount Hood. All day, the woods were giving me the creeps. They were too still, to the point that I started to worry about big predators in the area. That night, we got this intense feeling of being watched. I have to stress. I truly love the woods at night, so I'm not one to get spooked just by being in the dark. It was deeply quiet and still, and then my friend started pointing at something in the trees. I'm going to sound insane describing this, but it's what we saw. A couple hundred yards away from us, weaving through the trees, there was this orange light. To me, it looked to be about the size of a basketball or slightly smaller. It was glowing bright enough to leave a small trail behind it, and it was totally silent. At first, I thought it was a drone of some kind, but we watched it float around through the trees tighter than any drone I've seen, and there were no other lights like you'd see on a standard drone. It wasn't a person with a light because it was too high and way too fast. We watched it bob around for about 10 minutes. Then it vanished for about half an hour and came back, this time a little closer but moving a lot faster. I lost sight of it pretty quickly. After it left, the forest went back to normal and felt way less ominous. I had no idea what it was. This really happened, and it's one of the most unnerving things. So, it was the 4th of July, and my brother and I were setting off fireworks in the woods behind our house. We were passing back and forth an aim and flame cigarette lighter, lighting firecrackers, and other small fireworks. It was around 2 in the morning on July 5th. I left to get something to drink and left my brother there, lighting fireworks. I get back around 10 minutes later, and he asks me for the lighter. I told him I didn't have it. I left it with him, and he was actively lighting firecrackers as I left. He says, yeah, I know. But I just gave it to you a couple minutes ago. Where is it? I know my brother. This isn't something he'd lie about. We've talked about it many times over the years, and the story has never changed. The moon was bright that night. Bright enough to see. He says he saw me in my same outfit. Same face, same hair, and everything. Apparently, the doppelganger said nothing, went up, and put his hand out. My brother assumed it was wanting the lighter. He gave him the lighter, and whatever it was, he walked away. I never said a word. These were woods privately owned by my family. Far out in rural Texas. Nobody else was out there. And if they were, 
that doesn't explain how they looked exactly like me. We continued setting off firecrackers until around 4 in the morning. I had to use a short cigarette lighter because the thing stole aim and flame. Pretty creepy. From when I was born until I was about 10, I lived in the middle of the woods in a smallish town called Nixon, Missouri. When I was about 8 years old, I was on the back patio with my dog, Raggy. It was pitch black outside. Raggy and I were just looking off into the darkness when a glowing white figure appeared at the end of my backyard by the tree line, walking right behind the fence. The figure seemed to be wearing some sort of jacket, but I couldn't see their legs because they were behind the fence. The figure looked over at me, and it seems like it realized I caught it and could see it because it disappeared the second it looked over at me. I thought I was just seeing things, but the second the figure disappeared, my dog went sprinting down the backyard, barking the entire way, and jumped up on the fence, seemingly looking for the figure. When he did this, my little 8-year-old self was filled with adrenaline, and I bolted into my house and started screaming and crying to my parents, who wouldn't believe a word I said. Ever since that day, I have never doubted the existence of supernatural beings, despite my parents constantly denying the experience having ever taken place. Me and my old friend Raggy know though, I just wish dogs could talk so my parents will quit calling me crazy. Haha, ha, let me know if y'all have had a similar experience. In the mid to late 2000s, I was an avid hiker in the Appalachian Mountains. I have been all up and down the at, but I spent most of my time in TN and Virginia one day, my main hiking buddy and I were following a main trail when we ran across what looked like a game trail. Being curious dumbasses, we decided to follow it. Very quickly, we started hearing a very odd sound. It was humming, like electricity. We got closer and found a clearing with a large, dilapidated barn. In the middle of nowhere, not even a road is close. And we found that the hum was from thousands of mud daubers that had nested in the dirt mound that was the foundation of this barn. Obviously, we were very careful not to disturb them, but we made our way to the back side of the barn and found another trail. It led to a cabin, a small wooden shelter with four bunks, built by the Boy Scouts in the 1930s, according to the plaque on the door. We thought this would be an awesome place to camp and left shortly thereafter with the intention of bringing back other friends. A few weeks later, we took two of our friends up to this place, so there were four of us total. We knew we had shelter, so we didn't bring a tent or anything, just sleeping bags and a lot of food. Oh, and LSD. We all dropped off when we got to the cabin and then set to making our beds and building a fire to make dinner. Now mind you, this cabin is in a small clearing, maybe the size of a football field, and there is only one trail. Let's call it from the west to make things easier. It is several hours after we got there and set up, we are all tripping a bit, beers are flowing, and weed is blowing. When the four of us were sitting around the fire, we all stopped. We hear something coming from the north. Mind you, no trail, just lots of brush, shit is nearly impossible to walk through. As we sit staring, an old man, probably in his 60s, white ponytail and all, comes out of the brush with his two big metal walking sticks. We flipped out. All four of us immediately pulled our knives and prepared to defend ourselves. The old guy put his hands up and said, easy boys, I just saw your fire and was wondering if I could share it for a bit. We calmed down and allowed him to warm himself, it was a fairly chilly spring night and at least midnight by this point. He sat by the fire. We offered him food, and he accepted. He then proceeded to tell us stories about the area. Like he told us about the people who owned the wasp barn nearby a hundred years ago and shit. After he ate and warmed himself for maybe a half hour, he got up and grabbed his walking sticks and said, thank you, boys, you gotta go. And he walked straight south. Like in a straight line from where he came. But there was no trail there. The next morning, we went looking both to the north and south and couldn't find a single trace of this guy. I know what you're going to say, and yes, we were high as kites, but we all met and talked to the man. And we all woke up the next day curious and went looking. None of us could find a single trace of his existence. What really ducked with us was that as we made our way home, back out of the trail to the west and then north, we saw him again. Sitting on a log in the middle of a stream is a good way to get off the trail and down a ridge. In the opposite direction, he had walked off. We waved, and he waved back. And as soon as we went around the corner of the trail, the four of us sprinted as fast as we could, like two miles back to the car. I haven't been camping or hiking since. I live in a very rural area of East Tennessee. I live in what is known as a holler, or hollow, in a mountainous part of the state. Everyone who lives here is a relative of my husband. The houses start about halfway down the road with his parents and our houses in the front. Coming down our road, you have forest on the right and a cow pasture and barn to the left. It's about a mile and a half to get to the houses from the main road. When it gets dark here, it's really dark. 
there are no street lights, and we keep the barn lights off unless it's calf season. You cannot see the main road from the houses because the forest is so thick. You can't see car lights until a car is on our road and comes around a curve from the main road. The curve is about a mile for the houses. I was in the kitchen cooking dinner, waiting for my husband to get home from work. I was standing at the stove, and I happened to glance up at the window, hoping to see his car lights. Instead, I saw a flicker of orange light. I first thought I was seeing a reflection in the window of some kind. I moved around to see what it was. There isn't anything orange or red in my kitchen, and I ruled out my hair, I have red hair. It happened again. An orange flickering light. I then thought it was a fire, but it was very small and kept coming and going. There was no reason for anyone to have a fire in the cow field, as we have a fire pit and a burn pile behind the houses. Plus, I went through a complete house fire a few years ago and am rather paranoid about fire, so everyone usually tells me if they are going to start one. I moved to the living room to be sure I wasn't catching a reflection. I saw it from that window too. I finished up dinner while keeping an eye on it, and it continued to come and go. I never moved, I just flickered in and out. My husband gets home, and I asked if he saw anything on his drive up, and he didn't. I made him come to the window and watch. We waited about three minutes, and he saw it. We went out on the porch and could still see it. He calls his parents to see if they are burning anything or can see it. They aren't, and they can. So we decide we are going to walk out to the barn. We see it the whole time we are walking. We get about halfway to the barn, and it stops and never starts again. We finish our walk, check the barn, the cows, and the field, and nothing is amiss. We waited a while, but it never came back. We walked back and ate while checking periodically for the rest of the night. I've checked around the same time every day since. None of us have any idea what it was. I live in upstate New York, and a few years ago, my friends and I decided to recreate one of our favorite shows growing up in the 90s, called Are You Afraid of the Dark? We were going to build ourselves a fire pit out in the woods, throw some logs around it, and tell some scary stories once it became dark, as they did in the show. That day, we went into the woods on the edge of town and found what appeared to be an old path. We decided to follow that because it would make navigating easier once it got dark later. After walking for close to 15 minutes, we realized we weren't on a path anymore. Deciding to keep going a little bit further, we ended up stumbling upon what looked like an abandoned campsite. There were a few tents all ripped to shreds, clothes hanging from tree branches, and a couple of those fabric lawn chairs that had also been torn to hell. Thinking it was a perfect setting for what we had planned for later that night, we found a small clearing about 20 or so feet away and started digging out the fire pit and moving the logs into position. As we were doing that, we all noticed the feeling of being watched from over in the direction of that campsite. Chalking it up to our imaginations, we kept going. About an hour or so later, we were done, we got back on the path and headed back to our friend's house until nightfall. Once it hit around 10 p.m., we headed into the woods. It took us a while in the dark to find the path we had used earlier that day, and once we got on it, we had that same feeling of being watched again, this time from what felt like every direction. We only had a cheap flashlight in our phones, so we weren't able to see too far ahead of us. About five minutes in, we heard what sounded like a very thick branch get snapped in half. This made us uneasy, but we weren't going to turn around over a branch. Finally reaching the ripped up campsite, we made our way into the clearing we had set up our fire pit in and started the fire. We all sat down around it, and my friend John began telling his story. A few minutes into it, I kept hearing what sounded like footsteps running behind me. Thinking it was probably just an animal, I ignored it. Another few minutes pass, and John finishes his story. Sam begins telling his story, but now the footsteps seem to be coming from different directions, all heading to our clearing. Sam stops talking, and we listen in silence. Nothing. It's dead silent. Then, all of a sudden, it sounds as though we're surrounded, there's footsteps running on all sides of us. They would come from a distance, then stop at the edge of our clearing. Then start again from another direction towards us. We're shining our phones into the woods, but we're not seeing anything. The footsteps keep going. Branches are snapping, and leaves are crunching all around us. Something is out there, and it's toying with us. Then, once again, silence. Everything feels still, the air feels calm. At this point, we had all moved closer to one another, and we heard nothing for a good two or three minutes. Then we hear this high-pitched giggle, it sounds like it came from a little girl. We shine our only flashlight in the direction of it, and there's the campsite. But there's no one there. At this point, we're huddled together. We begin whispering back and forth, making plans to stomp out the fire and run to the path, then we'd make a run straight out of the woods. We count down. 3, 
2. Seconds go by, and we're dreading saying it. We begin again. 3, 2, 1. We stomp out the fire, and we sprint towards the path, making sure not to lose sight of one another. Where's the path? It's supposed to be here? And where's Sam? Sam. We hear nothing. Do we go back, or do we keep running? We hear what sounds like someone behind us. It's not, Sam. About 30 feet to our left, we hear what sounds like someone falling. We hear Sam yell at us. We ran over, he had fallen, tripped, and fallen down a small embankment. We get him up and just aimlessly start sprinting. We must have dropped the flashlight, so the only light we have is the moon above us. We can barely see, we can't find the path, all we hear are the sounds of our breathing and footsteps behind us. So we run, and we don't stop. We're lost. Where do we go? We see a clearing up ahead, there's something in it. Getting closer, we see what looks like a stone well, with a massive piece of wood covering it. The footsteps stop at the edge of the clearing. The well gives us an uneasy feeling, as though it were covered to keep something in. We take off again, running for what feels like our lives. We finally made it out. We're in a field, with a road at the edge of it. We get halfway through the field, and we stop for a second to catch our breath. We felt safe, we'd see whatever had been chasing us from where we were if it came out of the woods. But it didn't. We got onto the road and started walking into town. We got back to our friend's house and realized just how torn up we were. We're all covered in scratches, and Sam was bleeding pretty badly from his tumble, but we were alive. I'm not sure what we encountered that night in the woods. But it was a feeling of fear that I've never experienced before and hope to never experience again. And if you're ever out in the woods of upstate New York and you come across an old, ripped up campsite, turn and run. I sure wish we had. I live in Victoria, Australia, and we don't get snow unless you venture up the mountain, where the climate is significantly colder. As expected, I very rarely see snow in person, so during my childhood, my mom and I would visit my papa up in Glenorchy, Victoria, at least once a year. He would drive us up a nearby mountain, where we would indulge in what little snow we could play in. It was never particularly memorable, but I loved it. I have a distinct memory of the nausea from the bending roads and of my ears getting blocked from ascending so fast. And I'll never forget the fear that our car would swerve off the narrow road and roll off the cliff. Good old times. It was on one of these trips that my mom and I were on a small hike through a thriving forest up in the mountains. Unfortunately, I don't remember the name of the location, as I was around 8 to 11 years old at the time. There wasn't much snow as usual, just patches, but it was beautiful, and there was no one else in sight. I can't recall why it was just the two of us at that moment. My papa did have a short temper at times, so possibly my mom wanted a break from him. I remember feeling so content with our lives at that moment. Then this feeling washed over us. A feeling of impending doom and danger. It was a sinking feeling in my chest. I remember asking my mom something like, do you feel that too? As we just stood there, bewildered. We felt that we didn't belong here and that we should leave immediately. Now, might I add that this was during the day, not at night? I had been in scouts most of my childhood and was also very familiar with this type of environment. Yet, here we were, frantically looking around for the source of this dread, feeling deep in our gut. It felt like we were being watched, like a thousand judgmental eyes were on us. It was so intimidating. I remember my heart beating rapidly and my body shaking as we quickly paced back to my papa's car. There was no sound of sticks breaking, no ominous figures within the trees, and no growling of a monstrous creature. Just a feeling. I asked my mom to describe her side of the story, and she remembers an image in her head of a large creature crawling up the mountain to get us. She felt as if it were in the wind, with every big gust, it would come closer and closer. There was a nagging voice in her to leave, yelling get out over and over again and getting louder the longer we were there. It's a bit dramatic, but still an interesting interpretation of the same event. Unfortunately, nothing else happened that day. We made it back to the car safely and proceeded with our trip. Maybe it was for the best. Who knows? I thought I was the only one who remembered this experience, and I just assumed that it was all in my head. After all, I was a very anxious child, and my mind could have exaggerated the whole event. However, it was only a couple of years ago that my mom mentioned it, and I realized that it really did happen. It makes me so happy because I crave these paranormal or unexplained experiences in my life, but I've had very little luck. Maybe it's my skeptical thoughts that hinder me from accepting that our world is a lot more supernatural than we perceive it to be. I don't know the history of the location, sadly, because that could provide a possible explanation for the event. Was it supernatural? A negative entity? Cursed land? 
I am aware of numerous places deemed cursed by indigenous Australian communities and landmarks they refuse to set foot on. Or could it just be a one-time experience, some force just passing through and not originating in that area? My mom is also a very spiritual individual and is more open about these encounters. She has experienced similar feelings in other locations, one of which was recently while she was visiting houses on the market. It was a shed in the backyard of a property that triggered this feeling. She sensed such a strong urge to leave that area and not move any closer to that shed. There was something inherently wrong with it, or a negative presence resided in it. Who knows? Back in 2014 to 2015, I was going out deep in the dark forest in England at night. I don't know why, but I wasn't frightened, but up until this day, I've been afraid because I saw something so clearly that it was obvious it was a ghost. I was on the verge of getting mentally ill at that time, but I was okay. In those couple of days, I visited my local park at night. At some point, it was a full moon, but I am not sure if I remember if it was on the night I saw a ghost. Let me describe the ghost and what I did with most of it. I can't remember what I did, but be sure I saw something. There at the bottom of A was something floating, a flame like objects going closer and away from me. Like, how did it do that? At first, I thought to myself that it could be some cigarettes lighter, that's what it looked like, but it was going on and off and also moving in the same spot hovering there. It was weird, and what was scary was that I was in the forest in the dark. This supposed flame was near the river, and I was on higher ground on a hill. Everything in that forest was pitch black. I could see a slight footpath, and my knowledge of the area's location was good, so I knew where I was going, so I safely got out of the forest in time. If something had happened, I could have been abducted, whatever that spirit was or wanted from me. I shouted calmly, who's there? And hello again in a split 10 seconds. It was floating there, and then it disappeared, and I went on my way around the forest, maybe then to later go home, but I ignored what I saw for years until I realized what I saw was actually real. I knew which area I was in because I've been going to those parks during the day. Thinking about going to parks scares me now. In those couple of days, I also built a fireplace in the dark forest and fell asleep. I also kept hearing strange screams in that forest. I don't know what those were, they had never heard anything like it, but it sounded like weird screams like a woman was being tortured. The park or forest also has areas called the Devil's End, which I don't understand why it would be named that for. I want to know if anyone else has experienced the same. As a child or young teen, I lived in a very strange situation in the woods. I am not sure if this encounter may have been some kind of entity or perhaps something different. I hope someone can give me more information about what happened to me and my friend. I was around 12 years old at the time, and one of my best friends must have been 10. Alex's father had purchased a large amount of forested land around 100 kilometers away from the city we lived in, Montreal, Canada. It was all forest when Alex's family acquired it, they cleared a little patch to build a house, and the rest was pure, unadulterated forest. Their land was cut in two by a dirt road that, if you followed it for several kilometers, led to a few houses. And their land was very different depending on which side of the dirt road you looked at. On the right side, where their house was, the forest was light and luminous, or at least it felt that way. It was not too dense, with little rolling hills. A lovely place to play. On the left side of the road, though, it was another story. First, there was a deep ditch, perhaps two meters deep, which then became a quite high and steep hill. Weirdly enough, all along the long road, the ditch was full of car parts. A set of car wheels here, a door there, and a steering wheel way over there, all old and overgrown with moss. And over the steep hill, the forest gave off a really bad vibe. It had lots of very tall, dark coniferous trees with almost black trunks, and the place seemed somehow devoid of light or life. Climbing the hill, which we were seldom willing to do because of the creeps it gave us, there was some sort of swamp there. When we were there, there was this strange pressure. We sensed a kind of animal instinct that told us to leave this place. The strange atmosphere was spontaneously obvious to both me and Alex, and we playfully called that side of the road Demon's Forest. One weekend day, probably in 2001 or 2002, my family and I came to visit Alex's family. Bored by the adults, my friend and I decided to go and play in the forest. Alex's father told us to watch out, there was an animal that had been rummaging in their trash bin and causing other nuisances. He said it was a dog that looked somewhat like a Rottweiler and surely belonged to someone living up the dirt road, he warned us that we shouldn't interact with the dog if we saw it, as it didn't look healthy, as far as he could tell, or something was weird about it. He said it somehow looked diseased or contagious or had patches of fur missing, I can't remember exactly. And so we set out on our walk. It was autumn, and the leaves were pretty and golden, 
many having already fallen to the ground. It was a calm, slightly overcast, windless day. The air was very still and calm. Alex and I decided to walk along the dirt road, with the pleasant section of the forest to our right and Demon's Forest to our left. We chatted while following the road as it was rising up a slope. As usual, we were slightly creeped out going up the road because of the weird vibes of the forest to the left side, but we were challenging ourselves to be brave and trying to not really think about how unsettling it felt. A good distance away from their home, when it was already well out of sight, I noticed the first strange thing of the day. On the left side of the steep hill, there was a very large and dark pine tree hanging over the road. Somebody had attached a pink ribbon to one of the branches, which was already strange since this was the territory of Alex's family and they had no daughters, other little girls likely to hang around, or other people who may be owners of pink ribbons who were likely to hang out on this deserted road. The strange thing was that the ribbon was flailing strongly in the wind, its loose ends were flapping almost horizontally. The thing is, it was a completely windless day. There was no wind to speak of. The ribbon was within my reach, so I even touched it as it was flailing. I even licked my finger and held it in the air to check if I could feel any wind or air current at all, as my dad had taught me. The air was perfectly still. Yet the ribbon failed. I mentioned it to my friend. He seemed distracted, was younger than me, and sometimes didn't catch on to what I said, so I didn't press the matter. We continued our climb. We reached a place where the hill on the left side of the road had a gentler slope and began further away from the road. In fact, it looked as if the hill was kind of carved out in a way that would have made it easy for us to climb to get into Demon's Forest. It almost seemed as if the hill was carved in a sloping half circle, like in a theater, and the road we stood on would have been the stage. It gave us a very clear, treeless view of the hillside, full of golden and red fallen leaves. The trees began at the top of the hill, maybe 9 meters higher. We stopped to admire the view, Canadian autumns are a sight to behold. Alex suddenly got really excited. He thought he heard something in the demon woods up the hill, and he really wanted me to pay attention. He explained that there are wild cats in that forest, they had spotted them with his dad. One of them had reportedly had kittens, kittens being one of the most exciting things in the world for kids our age, getting us all riled up, but somehow, my hackles were up and I could really relax, even thinking about adorable wild kittens. He actually thought he had heard the cat meow in the forest, up the hill, close by. I heard nothing of the sort and thought he was inventing it. He vehemently suggested that we try meowing at it to see if it would respond, maybe it would even bring its kittens along and we could see them and play with them, he said. I hadn't heard any sounds at all and didn't really like his idea of screaming meows into the creepy forest, what kind of wild cat would respond to human children, anyway? Wouldn't it be obvious that we are not cats from the sound of us? That seemed like a dumb idea to me. Before I could try to talk him out of it, he loudly meowed into the forest. To my utter shock, the forest meowed back. Alex was delighted. He meowed again. Something in the forest answered again. I was actually shocked, this didn't make sense to me. And it creeped me out. But I suspended my disbelief to see what would happen. He kept meowing over and over, for every one of his meows, there was one coming back in response from the woods. Something felt off to me. Feral or wild animals didn't behave that way, even at 12 years old, I realized that. And it wasn't an echo, the cat did not bounce back any sound that we threw at it except meows, which it reciprocated immediately, and anyway, there were no hard rocky surfaces around off of which sound could bounce off, everything was covered in a soft layer of sound dulling leaves. Alex got even more excited, listen. The cat is coming towards us, she's coming to see us with her kittens. To my surprise, he was right. There was a rustle of dead leaves coming from above us, from above the slope in the creepy forest. It seemed like the rustling was getting closer to us but it was way off. Because cats are small, light, and careful with their steps. They don't make a ruckus when they walk through the woods. But here, the rustling leaf sound was extremely obvious, along with the meowing. And in fact, it sounded more like steps. Like someone with two legs walking in the leaves. And it was getting closer to us. My alarm signals were starting to go off with the wrongness of it all, while my younger friend was oblivious. He was calling it more vehemently, noticing that it was coming towards us. Then I realized what seemed so wrong, the sound was coming towards us, but there was nothing to be seen. Right in front of us we had the gently sloping hill, treeless and clearly visible, anything coming from the forest should have been plainly exposed to view. There was nothing. There is no source for the rustling sound, nothing is moving. Oh, her kittens are joining her. Listen, there are more sounds. They're coming to play with us. He was right. The walking sound seemed to have multiplied and now came from various directions at once. 
ever getting closer, with nothing being visible. Something was way off, I wanted to leave. But Alex was getting mad at me, the kittens were almost here, and he wanted to see them. He insisted. At this point, it was extremely tense, and fight or flight was activating from the wrongness of it all. We were alone and quite exposed on this theater stage to whatever was getting closer to us, which was, more and more obviously with every moment, decidedly not kittens. I was on the verge of forcing him to run home, and then, suddenly, I heard a very loud panting sound. Right at my feet. During the first millisecond, I was only mildly surprised, we had a huge husky at home. I was used to it panting next to my feet. But then, a sense of profound dread fell on me as I realized that, obviously, my dog was not here. And it must be another dog, a very big one, by the sound of it. Right at my feet. I panickingly looked down, ready to jump away from the dog that somehow got extremely close to me, almost on me, without my noticing. There is absolutely nothing at my feet. But I still hear the loud, breathy panting sound coming from there. I whirl around, all 360 degrees, screaming. Where is it coming from? There is nothing at my feet or anywhere around me. There is nothing there. Yet the sound is clearly there. As I whirl about in a frenzy, I look up the dirt road we were following. Around 100 meters away, at the top of the slope, I see a lone dog standing. It looks somewhat similar to a Rottweiler, but in very, very bad shape. Extremely unkempt, with patches of fur missing, shaggy and dirty as heck, and some skin exposed where the fur is missing. It looks down on us, too. Obviously, there is no way that I could hear it panting at that distance, and the source of the sound is at my feet. At that point, the flight instinct wins for me. I have never run as desperately and as fast in my whole life, thank goodness it was all downhill. Alex kept pace right beside me, terrified. We made it home in one piece. We didn't walk in these woods anymore. I have come back to Alex's place several times in my life. I never wanted to walk in the woods again. As I research it now, I see that this land is historically Algonquin land. I moved to DC to attend college. There, I met my girlfriend, and we started dating seriously. I asked her if she'd like to fly home to Oregon with me for Thanksgiving break to meet my family and a road trip to Seattle to visit her close friend, etc. Me, being Oregon born and bred, decided it was my responsibility as a good PNW girlfriend to show her some of the sights. I decided to take her to Umpqua Hot Springs, one of the most gorgeous hot springs on this side of the Rocky Mountains. I grew up in Bend, so it was roughly a two-hour drive, which was beautiful. My girlfriend was stoked to see the views from the mountain roads I frequented in my childhood, and we had a really nice time just appreciating the forests. Both of us are rather disorganized, so we ended up not getting to the hot springs until 4 p.m. This wouldn't have been a problem, but it was November, meaning the trailhead was closed, blocked off by a huge steel gate. We see a couple cars parked by the gate and decide to follow their lead in hiking out to the springs. I remember passing a bridge on the trail pretty early into the hike. We pass by a few other couples in their 20-somethings, say hi, and hike for about an hour until we reach the parking lot for the hot springs. We take some pictures of the graffiti and cross a second bridge, then start hiking towards the springs. We reach the hot springs, and there is a friend group there, late 20s or early 30s. We don't mind, and we make friends, exchange pleasantries, compliment one another's tattoos, etc. After about 40 minutes, they leave. My girlfriend suggests we hike out with them, but knowing she's from a city with light pollution, I want to show her what the stars look like in the forest. You can see galaxies up there at night, it's spectacular. She's a little nervous, but she agrees. We hang around for another half hour or so, stargazing, then we decide to leave. By now, it's completely dark, and we have to use our flashlights to find our clothes and get dressed. We leave, and immediately something feels wrong. It felt like we were being watched. Neither of us are familiar with the area. Trying to leave, we get turned around a few times and get really lost. She, being from the city, suggests we call the police, and I pretty much tell her that it would be hours before help could reach us, then longer to find us, and it would be best to get back to the car on our own. Our GPS isn't showing us where the bridge is, so we find the river and follow it until we reach a large rock blocking our path. By now, We've been turned around several times, and at this point, I'm convinced the forest is ducking with us. By some miracle, we find the bridge and cross it, and we're back on the path. That's when shit got spooky. Walking back to the car, the feeling of being watched became overwhelming. There were branches snapping loudly to the left of the path. My girlfriend seemed too freaked out to notice, and I didn't dare breach the subject until we were safe in my car. I heard something moving around, though, 
and I could feel this thing watching us. The snapping branches followed us as we progressed down the path. My fight or flight instincts kicked into gear, and I started talking about astrology, mutual friends, music, etc. to keep us both calm. I'm freaking the duck out. It felt like something was toying with us. After the longest hour of my life, we finally reached the other bridge. Once we cross it, I immediately feel better. The forest is quiet now, besides our footsteps. I finally relaxed. It was as if we entered and exited something's territory. It spooked the duck out of me. We reach my car, and there's a truck there that wasn't there before. I know this because I'd taken stock of the cars that were there when we arrived, and they were mostly suburbs. This truck, however, looked old and sketchy. As we're passing it, a creepy old man climbs out and approaches us, asking us where the hot springs are. At this point, it's probably 8 p.m. and pitch black outside. There's really no reason for him to be here alone at night in November. I step between him and my girlfriend, playing defense just in case, and hold my keys like a weapon. I tell him to follow the trail, grab my girlfriend, and pretty much sprint to our car. We get in, lock the doors, and speed home. I felt like such an asshole for getting us lost. GF was so sweet and helpful. I definitely didn't deserve that, lol. It was a beautiful outing, but spooky at times. Be careful if you stay there after dark. The ominous deep forest entities might just start ducking with you. I'm curious to know if any of you have any similar stories. Me, my two dogs, and my now fiancé drove a long way to get to our campsite in the Ozarks. Barkst Recreational Area, to be exact, and it is west of Mountain View, Arkansas. We drove all day Wednesday, May 19th, to get to our campsite and set up by dark. We are completely alone at the campground, as it's the middle of the week and the week before Memorial Day. And the camp we chose is a recreational area, which means no electric hookups, water, or bathrooms, and definitely no camp staff. As we are setting up, I hear this bass-like rhythmic noise that I'm only noticing in my subconscious. I don't know why, but I'm feeling like something is wrong. He and I keep setting up our otherwise perfect campsite until I notice both of our dogs staring across the small mountain river and into the forest beyond it. Then I ask myself, haven't I been hearing this strange noise coming from that direction? And now they hear it too? I ask my boyfriend to stop rattling tent stakes and lend his ear to this noise. He hears it, and the dogs are even more alerted to it since all the other noises, including literally all of the bugs, frogs, and birds, not to mention our own unpacking noises and us chatting, have ceased. At first, we wrote it off. It must be some new mountain noise that we just aren't accustomed to, we live in a relatively flat region of the country, and my boyfriend says it could be the rocks settling. I didn't think that was quite right, but I'm not about to go investigate at dusk in bear country before camp is set up. As we're putting the final touches up, like rugs and some solar string lights for the nights to come, the noise gets louder. I would say they were almost more comprehensible. They weren't just a bassy noise anymore. The noise had bass, but it wasn't just bass. It almost articulated, like it was making nonsensical syllables, then pausing, then making more. It got closer and closer, like it was coming towards the edge of the small river opposite us, and I swear on everything I love that it was talking some strange static, like you were stopped by a car with busted speakers at a stoplight and they were blaring gothic trap music, but just the talking part, and with your windows up. No music. Just loud, muffled mumbling and static. I had a hard time not telling my boyfriend that we should just go. We had both heard it as well as the dogs. But it quickly got farther and then went away almost completely, so we decided to zip ourselves up in the tent and try to sleep. I woke up many times during that first night to my female dog trembling and growling, and when I strained and listened, I could hear that same muffled bass noise in the distance once again. I did manage to sleep a few hours that first night, and morning thankfully came before the noise could get closer again. The following three nights were completely normal. They were filled with the sounds of tree frogs, bullfrogs, whippoorwills, cicadas, and owls, just like you could imagine from the mountains at night. On Friday night, we had a couple neighbors camping with us, and even more on Saturday. My boyfriend also proposed in the middle of a shallow river on our big 18-mile hike, and of course I said yes. Other than that strange, ominous noise that accompanied us on our first night, it was the best trip I could have ever asked for. I'm just wondering if anyone here might have a rational answer. In 2018, my partner and I drove up to a national forest in Oregon for a day hike in the early summer. The area was somewhat remote, but not too isolated. Hiking is huge in the Pacific Northwest, so there are plenty of other people on these trails at any given time, especially during peak season. Because of this, we chose a less popular trail in the hopes of getting some alone time. 
It was an approximately 6 mile out and back moderate difficulty hike with a waterfall at the end. It followed a river and didn't intersect with any other trails. Simple enough, right? We were both experienced hikers in good physical condition, so we had no reason to think we needed anything but day packs with a couple liters of water and sandwiches. Getting back before dark should have been a piece of cake. We set out sometime after noon. At first, we took it slow and meandered around the riverbank for a few minutes. I found a cool animal bone, and we mused over what it might be. It was clearly a vertebra from a large mammal, so we guessed it was probably a deer bone. Because I'm a little morbid and like collecting things of that nature, I put them in my pack. That might not have anything to do with what happened next, but I feel like I should mention it since it was out of the ordinary. The hike to the waterfall was beautiful. We passed a few other people on their way back to the trailhead, but for the most part, we had the place to ourselves. We stopped a few times to look at wildlife or take photos of flowers. I was tracking our progress on my Fitbit, so I always knew how many miles we'd traveled and how much time we had before sunset. We reached the waterfall at about 3.2 miles, which matched what the map had said. I paused my watch, and we settled on a large boulder to rest and eat our lunch. Another young couple was there with their dog. We said hello and then minded our own business. Here's where everything went wrong. As we packed up our stuff and prepared to leave, my partner, Michael, slipped off the boulder and twisted his ankle badly. The other couple heard his surprised scream as he splashed into the water, so they rushed over to help. The three of us hauled him back to dry land and assessed the injury. None of us were doctors, but we thought it was a sprain. The swelling had already begun, and Michael said the pain was serious. He could barely stand. Upon realizing this, the male half of the couple started backing away and seemed anxious to leave. I asked him if he could go get help, but he didn't respond. Neither did his wife. They both just turned around and started booking it up the trail with the dog trotting behind them. I called out to them in frustration, but they didn't look back. Needless to say, we didn't have cell service that deep in the woods, so we couldn't contact anyone else. We had to hike back, it'll be okay, I said to Michael. It's only three miles. You can do this. We shifted the water bottles and our modest amount of gear into my pack so he wouldn't have to carry anything and made decent progress. I was still tracking the hike on my Fitbit. After about two miles, Michael ran out of steam, and we rested again. I told him to lean on me to take the weight off his injured ankle. Even though I'm a head shorter than him, it seemed to help. We're almost there, I said. Just one more mile. Despite the setback, we were in pretty high spirits. The sun was still up, and the woods were still beautiful. We made light of our predicament. Michael joked that he can't do anything without getting hurt or breaking something, and I comforted him. We both thought the ordeal was nearly over. Eventually, I realized we'd been walking longer than expected. I assumed it only felt that way because we were moving at a slower pace, but when I checked my watch and saw that we'd gone farther than a mile, I started to worry. We were at 6.6 .6 miles total. That meant the walk back to the trailhead was longer than the walk to the waterfall. That couldn't be right, but I figured I must have made a mistake at some point. Maybe I hadn't started the tracker until we'd already traveled a ways at the beginning? Regardless, the parking lot had to be around the next curve in the trail. But it wasn't. We went another half a mile or so before stopping to assess the situation. Over seven total miles and we still weren't back. What the hell? I checked the map of our hike on the Fitbit app and saw that there weren't any gaps. It was a straight line from beginning to end, with the line doubled back on itself, indicating that we were on the same route. But where was the trailhead? We talked it over and concluded that it had to be a glitch. Michael was adamant that we hadn't passed the trailhead, and we couldn't have taken a wrong turn because there were no other trails. Plus, the scenery was all familiar. We saw things we remembered passing on our way to the waterfall. It was definitely the same trail, and it was well maintained too. A big, wide dirt track that followed the river and didn't veer off into the undergrowth. Losing the trail was impossible. At that point, we started to feel demoralized, but what could we do except keep going? Our phone still didn't have service. Michael was in a lot of pain and struggled to put weight on his sprained ankle. It was twice the size of his other ankle. He was sweating. I was sweating. The whole thing started to feel like a nightmare. When we went another mile and still didn't reach the trailhead, we panicked. Night fell quickly in the forest, and we had little daylight left. We were almost out of water, we had no rain gear or other food, and the only flashlights were the ones on our phones. Of course, we cursed ourselves for not bringing more supplies, but we were only supposed to be out there for a few hours. It was just a short day hike, and we had no idea how it could have gone so wrong. Out of desperation, I yelled for help. We'd seen no people since that strange couple had abandoned us near the waterfall, 
but I was sure that we had to be close to the parking lot. That didn't mean there was anyone there, but we were both so freaked out that I was willing to make a fool of myself if it meant rescue. To our dismay, nobody answered. We were alone. In an attempt to get a grip, we reasoned that maybe we really had passed the trailhead we started at. Maybe we were so focused on keeping Michael off his bad foot that we'd simply missed it and were hiking toward the next trailhead. We were pretty sure that wasn't the case, but it was the only explanation that made sense. We were definitely still on the same trail, and though we couldn't be certain, it seemed like the landscape had changed. We no longer recognized any of the landmarks, except the river, and that seemed to support our theory that we'd gone too far. We knew we weren't walking in circles. That wasn't possible. Should we turn back? We mulled that over for a few minutes. If we were wrong, backtracking would guarantee spending a night in the woods. Michael couldn't deal with that ankle forever. We decided to press onward. I'm not crazy, right? I asked. That initial hike was only three miles. We went three miles to the waterfall. Yes, Michael agreed. The entire hike was supposed to be a little over six miles out and back. We've walked a lot farther than that. We should have gotten back a long time ago. I don't understand what's happening. When night fell, we picked up the pace. Michael stopped leaning on me and limped down the trail as fast as he could. He later said adrenaline dulled the pain of his injury and gave him the motivation to continue. That part of Oregon is mountain lion country, and I just read about a lion attack a few weeks prior to our hike. Being caught out there in the dark was the absolute last thing we wanted, but there was nothing we could do about it. We were scared. Michael shone his phone light on the path ahead to make sure we didn't lose our footing, and I shone mine at the trees, scanning for cat eyes. I was crying. Fitbit said we'd hiked 9 total miles. After 9.5 miles, we finally saw the sign for the trailhead and scrambled toward it. Relief didn't completely wash over me, though, because I expected we'd have to either hitchhike back to where we started or trudge along the side of the road for a few miles more. There was simply no way this could be the trailhead. It was three miles past where it should have been. As we climbed the short set of steps up to the parking lot, sweaty, thirsty, exhausted, and completely unnerved, I hoped to see a car. My prayers were answered, but, it was my car. We were at the same trailhead. For a moment, Michael and I stared in shock. Our fear and misery were replaced by sheer confusion, and we just stood there. Then a twig snapped somewhere in the woods behind us and broke the spell. We hurried across the parking lot towards the car, and in those few seconds, I felt an intense dread. The best way I can describe it is the feeling you get in a nightmare when something is pursuing you and you're trying to run away but moving in slow motion. Your legs just won't cooperate, and you know the thing chasing you is going to catch up. This is the only time in my life I've ever felt that way outside of a dream. We managed to pile into the vehicle and peel out of the lot. I was shaking. Michael was rambling about time distortion and dehydration and how we must have lost our bearings somehow. We got out of the national forest and onto the highway, and it was a while before we encountered any other cars. I didn't fully relax until we made it back to civilization. Neither of us can figure out exactly what we experienced. Michael was on crutches for months following that incident, and his ankle has never been the same. I still have the bone I found, but I keep it in a box because it gives me bad vibes. When we go hiking these days, we stick to the crowded trails. Whatever happened that day, we do not want it to ever happen again. My husband has always loved the woods and nature just as much as me. So when I found out that he'd never been camping, I just knew I'd have to take him. Keep in mind that I've only been camping at the beach my whole life. Never in the forest. About two years ago, me, my husband, and our three-year-old daughter moved to Arizona. We moved to Phoenix, and being only about two hours away from Flagstaff, I decided to take him camping. We ended up in Williams, a smaller town 30 minutes away from Flagstaff. We loved it there. The forest was beautiful, and it was so quiet away from the city, it was amazing. We didn't find a spot to camp until about 9 o'clock at night. The spot we chose was pretty nice. It was right by Coleman Lake, which isn't a lake at all just a big patch of grass. It's a little open field surrounded by trees, there's also a little dirt road that goes through it, and the best part was that we were a good way away from any other campers. We set up tents in the dark, our only light was coming from our car. When we were all done, we started a fire. Our daughter was tired, so we put her in the tent right behind us to go to bed. About two hours had passed, and we decided to turn in for the night. At 3.28 am, I woke up. I don't know exactly what woke me, but I had a really weird feeling. I lay there, looking up at the top of the tent, for what felt like forever. That's when I heard it. From somewhere in the woods behind me, something was walking towards our tent. I told myself it was probably just a deer or an elk, 
since we could hear elk practically screaming most of the night, so I knew they were close by. But whatever it was, it stopped right behind our tent and didn't move for what felt like hours. I was so scared I couldn't move. I couldn't wake up my husband, who had his gun with him, to tell him something was outside. I don't know how long I lay there waiting for it to move, to walk away, or to do something. But soon the sun came up, and that was the end of it. I pulled myself together and went outside to check. But nothing was there. And I swear, it never left. I told my husband, but he just brushed it off. You probably fell asleep, and at some point, the deer walked off. As much as I believed otherwise, I brushed it off. The next night went just the same as the first. Something walked up to the tent. Stood there. Then disappeared. It would be two months before we went camping again. Knowing that area the best, we decided to stay in the same camp as before. This time, my parents came with us. When night came, me and my husband were the ones left sitting by the fire as everyone went to bed. I began recalling the last time we stayed here, and my husband pointed out that there are a lot of elk in the area, and that's probably all it was. As we talked, we could hear someone screaming in the distance all around us. At 3.29 am, I woke up to something walking towards our tent. I was prepared to wake up my husband this time, not wanting to look crazy anymore. When the thing stopped once again behind our tent, I turned over to wake him up when something else happened that made me freeze. It started walking around the tent. It walked around the right side of the tent, the side I was laying on, stopped, picked something up, and began dragging whatever it was all the way to the front of the tent. It almost sounded like it was dragging a large stick. The second it got to the door of our tent, I somehow was able to wake up my husband and tell him someone was standing in front of our tent. Luckily, he has always been a man of action, so the second I said that, he grabbed his gun and opened the tent. All of this took no more than a few seconds, but nothing was there. He got a flashlight and walked around the area, but found nothing. He asked if someone or something was out there in front of our tent, like I said. Then we would have at least seen it or heard it running away. But I knew what I heard, I wasn't crazy. The rest of the night, we stayed up together. But nothing happened. The next morning, I asked my parents if they had heard anything. My father said no, but my mother said she thought she heard someone walking around outside but assumed it was us. And with that answer, I knew I wasn't just hearing things, this was real. The next night, I convinced my husband to stay up with me. We sat in the tent in silence. Around 3 a.m., my husband began to complain that he was tired. As I tried to beg him to stay awake, we heard the loudest scream from an elk I'd ever heard. Soon, it sounded like a whole herd of them came running past our camp from behind us. Scared by how close they got, we sat up and just stared at each other for what seemed like forever. Something must have scared them, probably a mountain lion or something, my husband said, still starting at me with wide eyes. Then, from some distance behind our tent, something started walking towards us. I grabbed his arm and told him it was here. He grabbed his gun and jumped out of the tent the second it was behind us, but nothing was there. It took several months before I was willing to go back. I don't know how I was convinced, but I decided to give it a third try. Once again, we went to the same spot. Me, my husband, our daughter, and my parents. To spare you the repetitive story, the first night went the same as usual, however, this time my husband heard it all too. Something is walking up to the tent and standing there. My husband goes out and scans the whole area, yet still nothing. Our second night was when it got more interesting and a lot more scary. Sitting by the fire when everyone else was asleep, we talked about the previous night. Everything was always fine when we'd come out of the tent, it was only when we were inside that things started to happen. My husband suggested we sleep outside by the fire this time. That way, if we hear anything, we just have to open our eyes to see it. I was unsure about the safety of the tent protecting me, but I said okay. We decided to take shifts while staying awake. He went first. And once the fire started to die, he'd wake me up to help him put more wood in, and then we'd switch off until the fire burned out again. It went on like this for several hours. But the later it got, the harder it was to stay awake. On one of my shifts, I fell asleep. I was slowly woken up by the sound of something passing by, and then it passed by again and again. It passed back and forth several times before realization hit me. I fell asleep. I sat up fast and looked around. It was pitch black, and I couldn't see anything more than a foot or two away from me. A feeling of fear came over me that I can't even explain, it was like a sense of doom. Something was out there, I just couldn't see it. I woke up my husband, and we quickly got the fire going again. And it was my turn to sleep. Eventually I was woken up to the sound of my husband whispering to me, Hey, hey, wake up, hey. I woke up, thinking he probably needed my help with the fire. But when I looked over, he was still sleeping, and the fire was out. 
I looked around, that same feeling of overdoom rushing over me, not bothering to wake him up. I got the fire started again. As soon as the small area around it was full of light, the feeling went away. I stood up, walked to the edge of the firelight, and looked out into the darkness. It was like the fire made a wall that separated us from whatever was out there, and it felt like whatever it was, it wasn't friendly. The next morning, as we packed to go home, we talked about what happened. Of course, no one believed us. But we knew something was out there. Later, my husband said he had heard something that night too. Something that sounded like me trying to wake him up, something calling him over. And when he woke up, I was asleep. That was the last time we went camping there. And, to be honest, I don't know if I'll ever go camping again. At least not in the woods. <laughs>